All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining. We're really excited. This is a first for us. So, you know, apologize for any uh, technical glitches that happen now. <laughs> but um, we're excited about this and we're excited to kind of have a broader community and um, get a bunch of people from all over the Pacific Northwest and some East Coast and a few from the South. So love it. I'm really excited that you guys have joined us today. Hopefully this is also just a, you know, fun way to connect with other people and and join in that way. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, you can see our topics for today um, have to do with um, Anthony will be presenting the analyst dilemma and talking a little bit about the breadth of an analyst. And then we've got some tips and tricks for the latest version of Tableau. So, um, and then we'll do a quick wrap up at the end. Look, I had a slide for this. Okay. <laughs> Um, real quick, who we are in case you've never joined us before. Um, my name is Isabel. I work with the Seattle Tableau user group. Um, so I'm remote in from Seattle today, which is also, you know, headquarters from Tableau. So we love the Tableau community. And uh, we try to have monthly meetups roughly once a month, usually towards the end of the month. And we try to do a lot of different things, have different speakers um, with different, on different topics, so different industries, as well as more general topics and we understand a lot of you are tuning in who have lots of different experience levels so we try and have a little bit of something for everybody so hopefully there's something for you today um, and we are sponsored by slalom slalom is a consulting company headquartered here in seattle but all across the united states um, i work with slalom so does anthony and uh, and we really love supporting the tableau community we love the enthusiasm. We love working with um, Tableau and, and building businesses ourselves. So um, also a big thank you to Tableau today, who is set it, who set up this Zoom meeting for us and is hosting us and uh, helping moderate a little bit and then doing some tips and tricks. So big thanks to both of those. Um, some fun additional resources while we're all working from home and the like for the next uh, at least maybe month, not sure. Um, Slalom does have a website where you can go to get some good resources, um, whether it's working from home or, or just dealing with the current situation. So that's at um, slalom.com slash forward slash now. And then Tableau also has a really cool page with some cool visas and data sets that you can go play with. Um, if, if you're not too freaked out hearing a lot about, you know, COVID-19 <laughs> right now, um, they've got some really cool stuff. So if you just go to tableau.com and look for their uh, COVID-19 data hub, there's some really cool stuff out there. So I just want to shout out to both of those. Some other ways to stay connected digitally during this time, of course, Tableau Public is an awesome resource. It's also a great place to go anytime for inspiration. Um, we encourage you to post and share there. Um, as well as a couple things, if you're looking to stretch your muscles a little bit, we've got, of course, Makeover Monday, uh, Workout Wednesday, and Sports with Sunday are great communities um, across the globe, actually, who are doing fun things that kind of help challenge our beta muscles. So definitely go and check those things out. Um, I'm going to put this up now so that if, for those who are CTUG, but also for if you are in a different community, we encourage you to go on to community.tableau.com find your local community. We're really get, looking forward to being back in person, um, hopefully in the not too distant future. This is fun. We'll definitely enjoy being digital for a little bit, um, but we love seeing you all in person and getting to connect that way. So we would love to invite you um, when we are able to meet up in person to keep an eye out for that. Also, we know we've had a few problems with our email listserv, so keep an eye out on our Twitter handle and our LinkedIn. Um, for updates for future events. So we do anticipate our next one being end of April. We're thinking it'll probably be digital at this point, but um, keep an eye on those social media accounts for updates after that. And then we are going to send out a follow-up survey at the end. And because we have a chance to reach so many people, we would love your feedback. We're happy to share that with the other um, tug group tugs as well. Um, but we would love to hear what would you want to see in future tug meetings? Um, what topics are you interested in? And things like that. So please keep an eye out for that um, later today. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm actually going to introduce Anthony, who you should be able, all be able to see. Anthony, I get I have the pleasure of working with Anthony at Slalom. Um, 
He's great and very excited to hear him talk about um, <laughs> what it really means to be an analyst and, and the titles become a bit good, ubiquitous. So welcome, Anthony. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Isabel. A great intro. Um, wow, the health of this user group uh, is amazing. Really seeing the, the whole region come together <clears throat> and really cool that we're still doing this from a virtual standpoint. Um, so I'd start by saying I hope you're healthy. Um, I hope that you're mentally healthy. I don't know about you, but I'm working on taking walks during the day, taking breaks, getting some exercise, um, and uh, meeting up with my family who fortunately do live in this house with me. So I can have some of that interaction. Um, I did have one antidote uh, that I heard yesterday that I thought was interesting. <clears throat> Down, downtown Seattle, I guess there's some neighborhoods that are at 8 p.m. are going out the window and they're begging pots and pans just to let people know that people live there still. <clears throat> So if that's useful to you, uh, maybe implement that in your lo local cul-de-sac, uh, whatever it might be. So again, Anthony Gould, I'm a practice area lead at Slalom. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, the analyst dilemma is what I've titled this presentation. I would say that I, I had some contribution in coming up with what I think is a pretty clever title. Um, the, the main reason I wanted to be here today, though, is, is because this is an ongoing conversation that we have with our team, but also with our client teams. The, the title analyst, like Isabel said, is ubiquitous. Um, we have analysts that we think of from like early career. We have Wall Street, uh, Wall Street analysts and, you know, like in late career and very savvy at what they do. Um, the ability to describe what we do continues to be more and more challenging. So what I hope that you're able to take from today is further identity and how we describe the role that we play, the breadth of that role that we play, the opportunity to work cross-functionally with different business groups as well as you know, different external teams in how we go solve uh, these business problems. Um, and I'm gonna include some next steps, right? Which I think could be, you know, you talking with, you know, team leads or personal, um, like a people manager, but also this community. This community is a vibrant place to be able to bounce some ideas off of. Um, I, we're gonna have some polls as part of this presentation. And I think that that could be pretty telling of like who we reach out to and, and some of the expertise that we have in this in this community. <clears throat> so I'll kick us off with, well, I hope that I can kick us off with this next slide. Here we go. All right, um, it's a pretty general definition of an analyst. And I guess that's what we're dealing with, right? Is that it's super general. <laughs> what does it mean to be an analyst here in 2020? Um, so I wrote down, it's a person who takes big situations, they add context, they help set the direction and add value in the process. Um, I know that I've sat down in many, you know, new business meetings <clears throat> and it's like, where do we want to go? What data exists? And none of those answers are there, right? But it's just generally, we need to do this and that's that goal. And you're the person there to, to help work through that problem. Um, I use the definition of good thing for that analyst. We would have totally made the wrong decision back there. Um, you're a valuable team member here. So I'm, I'm padding kind of this community a bit. Um, but really what I want to get down to is that we also at the same time of like knowing that we're valuable in these conversations, um, there is this general angst or fear kind of stress about how our skills are adding up and helping us uh, progress in our career. Um, just how our role is being viewed from whether it's um, there at Slalom, like when I'm talking with Isabel or Vignesh, um, or, you know, I've had these conversations at length with Gina as well. Just how do we describe the full breadth of what we do? From a tableau standpoint, right? These are beautiful books. These are wonderful people. The community is so vibrant, as I'd already mentioned. Um, as you're looking at the social and, and, you know, um, ecosystem of Tableau, uh, they've done something right, right? The, the ability to just be inspired by the work that's out there, uh, to pull down any of these books is, is amazing, right? We can add a ton of skills. What I would also say is that we can also have that self-doubt right? Like there's so much information in here in a breadth of even what's on this screen. It's just Tableau specific, right? From a tool perspective, right? There's storytelling, there's data integration pieces, um, the visualization and the endless conversation on the best chart to choose and the best color and font and, you know, uh, on you go. <clears throat> so right here, we can already start that circle of like self-doubt of like, what value am I bringing? And what I would say is that the constraints that you have from a Tableau public standpoint are different than what you have in your day-to-day uh, job, right? You have uh, you have different goals um, and priorities. You have, I'm sure, you have different timelines. Uh, so the, I just want to continue to reaffirm that um, that this is your role and what you bring to your business is beyond just a tool specific approach. Although there's so much that we can do to continue mastering these skills. <clears throat> 
So before I go to the next slide, um, in Q4, thinking about 2020 planning at, 20, uh, at, at Sloan with uh, data and analytics team, we stepped into a room and we started saying, you know, what, what is it we do and how do we describe that across the team as well as to our clients, right? In a succinct kind of elevator pitch way, not so much in sales perspective, but in these meaningful conversations that we have so that we can articulate the value that team members will bring. And we started with, and you might think this is a little consultancy, but a mind map, right? We were on the whiteboard all together, writing all at the same time. And, you know, I'll draw your attention to uh, a few areas that we, we talk about quite a bit um, here in the CTA community and the broader Tableau community, dashboard, right? And insights. We talk quite a bit about data integration, you know, what it means to do um, some light ETL and data modeling using uh, Tableau Prep or other tools. But there's, there's these other conversations, right? If you went to the Tableau conference and the analytics strategy and Tableau blueprint was highlighted so much, right? there's a whole um, aspect of your career that you can invest in. How do we best apply tools, but with people, process, platform that support the overall organizational goals? Right, so analytics strategy is massive, right? You can spend tons of time there. I wrote down hitting the mark. That's somewhat generic, but I'm going to introduce a, a role later in this um, presentation called uh, um, data facilitator. And I know in talking with many of you that you feel like that, right? You might call it the translator, um, something like that. But the point is, is this is a role that is, is really key to making sure that you have the right requirements, that you're setting the right expectations, and that you're moving the project forward well. <clears throat> Another role that comes into play there is the technical project manager, or at Sloan, we call it the solution owner. We broaden the, the role a bit to think of not just as a program manager, but somebody that wears the product hat, somebody that advocates for the actual outcome of that product, the analytics-driven product, that is, um, or embedded product, and, and make sure that we have the direct line of sight towards that, you know, the actual product that's going out the door and that we're delivering the right solution. That's, that's a whole role in and of, of itself. Um, the how we work, just to describe that a bit, you know, there's, there's a process in how we go about things. Um, many of us probably have unique processes where we have our own requirements checklists, our own production, uh, sorry, uh, uh, checklist to promote to production. Uh, but we also have just the way that we experiment and work through the questions that we bounce back to the business and a set schedule that we iterate and, and get feedback from the business. So that's encompassed in all of these things, right? How do we, at the beginning, give our elevator pitch? We talk about agile analytics. We work cross collaboration across team members. Uh, we think about that analytics workflow or flow in general, right? What do I need to be effective in my role and, and turn out really great results uh, in, in, in products for, for my team? I would think about cross solution literacy. So, you know, that could be into some of these industry verticals that we're looking at. Uh, but it can also be into mobile and web applications. So how do we work with software engineers um, or architects that think about networking and gateways and ways that from an analyst perspective um, and, and Tableau community, we don't have as much visibility or day-to-day -day working relationship with. So I'm gonna pause on this. Um, there's probably a lot more to be said. And, and by the way, there's probably things that I'm missing and I would love to see if we can get back post session, but I'd like, we have a, a survey question. And I'd love for this audience to look at the dark nodes within this mind map and, and just mention which one you align to. What's the top one that you align to? We'll give a few minutes for that. And I would imagine knowing this community pretty well that we're gonna um, kind of congregate in a couple of these but I think what's going to be interesting as well is, is seeing that, you know, we do cover the breadth of what's represented here. Um, it may not be our primary uh, kind of identifier, but um, I know this community represents uh, many of the, or all of the items on this mind map. All right, is there a way that we can uh, present that? Should we do a quick countdown? What do you think, Isabel? Yeah, I think uh, Alyssa can show us those results. There we go. There we go. All right, dashboard at 23% insights. Yep, those are kind of the top two. So reporting, that's an interesting one, right? I, th I think that we, we honestly, we don't talk about it a lot in, in Tableau, but the financial, the month over month and the QBR aspects of that rhythm of business, list reporting like um, anniversaries or birthdays or compliance reports, they're absolutely critical. 
um, and of course those operational reports. So that's, um, that's interesting that that one popped out so much as well. If only we could sort this. Just kidding. <laughs> this is great. Thanks. We're going to have two more polls um, in this presentation. So moving forward, you know, I, I give uh, give kind of a perspective that uh, in a conversation that we've had internally at Slalom, uh, but I wanted to bring in some additional insights. And, and so I went out to Gartner, obviously a, always a trusted resource. And some of the themes that I saw here, I'm going to I'm going to present over the next few slides. One of them is that analytics is pervasive, right? It's not in a specific area of your organization alone. It's not just in a centralized team. The notion of having these hybrid roles, um, you may have heard them called citizen analysts, citizen data scientists, citizen data steward, right? You can kind of go on down, on down the, uh, the map there. Um, but also thinking about people that were hired into a marketing role and they're, they're a marketing guru, you know, and, and they know that, um, they know that inside and out, uh, but they see that a regular part of their day job is also using data to either make a decision going forward or to look at performance from a diagnostic standpoint. And that's what we're talking about is these hybrid roles are more and more common or they're pervasive, right? I mean, it's not even like they're increasing. It was one of the big things um, that self-service and Tableau hit right off the top is how important this is. But, but managing this is much like um, managing the company culture. So you may have heard the idea of whether you intend to or not, you're always molding your company's culture. And I would say the same thing goes for your data culture. So how are you thinking about supporting those hybrid roles? but making sure that they don't become too siloed in a way that leads to inefficiencies, security lapses, or other problems um, that the organization then has to turn back, right, and, and fix. Uh, so how do we create a culture of data so that we support the experimentation, the moving fast of business groups, while you know, still maintaining the very important reporting that we have from a regulatory financial standpoint? Right, we can't, we've got to keep both of these things alive. So I'm going to go into uh, the next diagram here, and <clears throat> it's hard not to look at that Venn diagram, yes? <laughs> um, there's a notion that Gardner puts out there that says um, there's this continuous intelligence uh, phrase. And whether we like that phrase or not at the end of this presentation isn't important, but there's some merit in, in what they're really trying to convey. So if we look at that Venn diagram, I would like to start the digital transformation and talk about how this is something that organizations have, have embarked on. Right? They're usually in some uh, stage of digital transformation, thinking about how they can innovate, um, bring new products to the market, um, understand how they can meet their customer in a different way that's impactful, and they're doing the change management around that. So you can think of that as fairly foundational and kind of wrapping this entire thing. Moving to the right, you see business applications. Um, these are folks that are thinking about the lineage of data and how different ERPs or uh, company systems, whether it be Salesforce or otherwise, um, how that data is created and then managed as it's shared across these applications. So the folks in that role, you know, business analysts, business application analysts, they're thinking more about how the quality of the data is being collected and then how it's being sent downstream to different solutions, whether that be analytics or not. Um, so they're not thinking so much about measuring impact to the business as they are thinking about quality, right, in that integration point. Down at the bottom, you see information management. This is pretty classic, right? I think many of us are, are kind of tied to a, a business intelligence team, maybe a traditional IT team. Um, it, this is, remains important, right? How do we think about architecture and tooling in a way that moves our, our organization forward um, and supports some of these other pillars, right? That's kind of the whole point. And the, finest, the final one is business analytics. These are those citizen analytics roles I described on the last slide. So where those intersect, is what Gartner calls continuous intelligence. And then the blue on the left, they talk about three of those roles. Um, they talk about the leader, the architect, and the developer. And to kind of bring a little clarity to that continuous intelligence role, these are people that understand um, and have influence across these four different areas of an organization and can think about the broader solution, whether it's embedding analytics within mobile or web apps, um, working more closely with understanding your customer, embedding within Salesforce, Whatever it might be, they're the ones that are central to that conversation and moving it, moving those conversations and products forward in a way that's meaningful for your organization. So take it or leave it. That's continuous intelligence. I think there's some value merit to that conversation. <clears throat> okay. In addition to this and like how we think about where the organization maps out, 
um, what we've seen is that there's a couple different mindsets that are pretty prevalent about um, how we go about our role as an analyst and, and kind of delivering results or insights to the business. And they use the words deductive and inductive. Um, I'm going to go through deductive first. And don't worry, I had to Google this. I, I couldn't remember back to the difference. Let me see if I can describe it. I think I can. Um, the first in this top row is pretty traditional where we start with an aligned goal, right? So the organization has told us about what their goals are um, and how that's going to make a difference to the business. And these are pretty traditional um, dashboarding type projects, I would say. You're likely working with a reporting database or structured data, maybe a relational database where you have to fish a bit, you know, and, and work with different aggregations of data, things like that. Um, but it's fairly curated. Um, the KPIs could be pretty well defined, uh, but it's more about answering that business question with those existing data sets and KPIs. And you see what I would say is the analytics workflow kind of going across the screen. We inquire, we talk to other business users, uh, sorry, uh, stakeholders um, and business users, right? We need to know the end user's goals. Uh, we iterate through our analytics process. This is where we talk about flow and how do we continually get feedback so that we return those results out to the client um, or stakeholder. And finally, we communicate the results. Now the the other side, and if I want to say polar side, and of course there's a ton of gray between these two, is that inductive thinking. <clears throat> and I'm going to give a, a little bit of a demo of um, kind of how this is applied, at least in you know, kind of my mindset here. But it starts not from that clear definition of what done looks like, but it starts with hypotheses. It starts with a brand new data set. Maybe it's unstructured, maybe it's a third party data set, but it could be vast. It could be vast. Or it could be fairly, you know, like narrow um, and small enough data set, but there's a lot of information to be pulled from that. The point is, is that you're starting out with some hunches, some hypotheses, and you're going to go do exploratory analyses, right? You're going to go work with that untamed data and see what insights you can derive out. You're likely bringing a pretty full toolkit. You might be tapping into data scientists, other data engineers. Um, you're really tapping into kind of the full ecosystem of tools that exist at your organization. And finally, this one stuck with me, uh, certainly, is the results. So your results end up in one of three categories. Again, loved it. Um, the first one is noise. <laughs> How many times have analysis just been like, uh, the data is, there's so much in here, I, I can't discern anything, though. The second one is obvious results, which also happens a lot. Right, it reaffirms something that somebody knew long term. It doesn't bring any new insights to the business, but the ideal is it actually brings new insights. Um, this can be a fairly traditional data science workflow, but it applies to our job as well as analysts. So this is where I'm going to uh, flip into uh, my Race to Alaska dashboard. <clears throat> and please know I'm not just trying to you know put something that I put in public out there um, and kind of highlight it again. The main point is I want to share with you what my process was in finding insights because it wasn't a very large data set to work with, uh, but you'll see kind of how, how deep I ended up, <laughs> you can say, getting lost in this data and um, this story. Uh, real quick, jumping back there, if you don't know anything about Race Alaska, it's kind of described there in that first paragraph, but these are crazy people, <laughs> or other people call them adventurous, and they sail from Port Townsend, Washington to Ketchikan, Alaska. Um, no power, no support. Those are the only rules. There's a winner take all, you get $10,000, which by the way, isn't even enough to fix most of their boats because they're traveling some pretty rough waters with submerged logs, et cetera. Um, so this is for adventurous. It's a fascinating race that happens every year out here in the Northwest. And people that are on Olympic tracks, um, as well as people that have built boats in their garage, join this. Um, so this is really cool. Yeah, I see some comments, sea to ski uh, or ski to sea. Yeah, there's some really cool ones. Uh, there's another one in Tacoma, I believe, as well. So yeah, keep those comments coming in. It's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to share the data set. And there's two tabs in the data set that, um, that I was provided. Fortunately, I had two coworkers that did this race, and they're both data people. <laughs> so they were able to send over a, a very small data set, or I would say fairly small. Uh, the first one is the yachts, right? We have the ESN, which is our unique identifier between the two tabs. That's the electronic serial number. Um, from what I know, if I've completely missed that and you're a, a sailboat or, or boating fanatic, please tell me. Um, I'm fairly new to this, but passionate about, you know, like sailing is, is really cool. I'm blown away by this story. But that, um, that's the transponder. That's the um, electron device that was provided to each of the racers, each of the boats. 
Um, and it was also what was providing the, the regular pings from a lat long perspective. Uh, but this tab is fairly, fairly brief, right? We have a status of active or finished. There's um, post judge um, status and there's uh, did not finish, uh, disqualified and withdrawn. So some people don't make it all the way. Don't worry, nobody died, um, but they do withdraw, right? Uh, the going gets tough. Um, some people are at this for more than 20 days. And, uh, and that's a lot, right? To maintain food and energy levels, et cetera. They have a make of the sailboats. They have the length of the sailboat and the skipper. And then the other is even more simple. So like I said, unique identifier, lat long, the status of, um, of that racer or that boat and the time. And that's it. So, so I was given this data set. I'm blown away. I'm excited about, um, you know, all that could be in telling this story. Sorry, I'm bringing up Tableau here. And I, and I could, could at least have that intro to data. And I knew that, of course, the first thing I want to do is, is show something on a map. It's beautiful. Um, so I, I know that from a timestamp standpoint, I can do this and I can calculate speed, speed between the last reading, you know, based on distance and that time. Obviously, that's a, a pretty straightforward calculation. I can look at 24 hour um, speed, which is also something that could be interesting. And, and, and I can look at this, right, and almost get lost in it. Uh, so, you know, I, I've selected kind of a subset of boats here and they're starting right here in the Victoria Harbor and I can go out and, you know, every, every time this is, I can kind of see how these boats are tacking. And I mean, that had to be pretty exciting. It had to be really close proximity, probably chatting with each other. And we see that first day, right? And it goes, I think, till about <clears throat> 1 30 a.m. or so they sail and then they start camping out, right? So 12 15, I should say. And they sleep and get to it. Okay, so 6.15, 6.15, we see some boats starting to move. Uh, we've got a Lula that's sleeping away. And we have a couple boats that go north. And then a Lula makes an interesting decision and just <laughs> goes east. Um, so, so there's some interest there. Uh, to go find and of course just kind of get lost like what is the story like what are these boats doing uh, but then I'm starting to think like well okay well what what shades the track that they take right and and I start looking at um, I look at the hole type there's a multi-hole and there's single hole right they have different coefficients effectively in the water um, and so different wind conditions are going to favor one boat over another so I start comparing that right and I'm, I'm toggling back and forth between this um, this that is in my data uh, from the underlying yacht uh, dimension data set. And I'm looking at this and I'm, I've got like this that I'm looking at and I'm kind of toggling back and forth, throwing it on these rough dashboards and, it, and nothing's really standing out to me, right? Like it doesn't seem like a complete driver in this, in this uh, situation. So I'm about, well, what other data sets exist? I'm looking at weather reports. Uh, well, what about the crew size? You know, do the number of people on the boat matter? Uh, I think one of the boats that in the beginning um, was, uh, had like nine people on it. I can't remember exactly, or sorry, they got set place, but it was a boat full of people versus, you know, these boats with two or three people or even one person boats. Um, so as I started exploring deeper, I was starting to think about these other data sets. I was wondering, did the route matter? You know, some people choose in these areas, um, and I'll, I'll jump to this one, they choose these inside passages, which are gonna be protected by the wind more so, uh, but those that go out in the open water, it's gonna be completely choppy, right? And they're not gonna be able to uh, row their boat and, you know, like get an oar down even in those choppy conditions. And so I'm like fascinated, like why did they make decisions so differently uh, along the way? So even boats that are like in the same kind of range, like how fast they're sailing, et cetera. I put a lot of these heat charts together and I was looking at, you know, what I landed on for these top five boats is that they were racing pretty close proximity. Um, so if you look here, right there, there, um, this, this middle chart is the running total of miles um, all the way to finish. And, and especially these two through five boats are really close proximity. Like again, yelling distance, cheering distance, <laughs> whatever was happening out there on the water. Uh, but we can see that there's some pretty, you know, heat, there's a, from a heat map standpoint, you can see that there's some, some areas that they really started to move. And I'm sure that final day was just like celebratory, um, being able to get that wind and move fast. But yeah, through that analysis, and, and by the way, I've got this kind of like hidden chart down here that ended up in the Tableau public dashboard that you can download 
Um, the reason I put that there is because when I go over to phone um, and I put it in this vertical, I decided to include it. So it's nearly an Easter egg. It's not intended to be so, but it was actually one of these really key things that helped me think about the different segments of, uh, of boats. So anything gray did not finish. So you've got a boat here that, um, bad kitty, um, that was cruising, right? They were doing well. And this group here, I, I titled the top 13. Um, I titled this the middle 11. I mean, like if you're a marketer and you see your segments and personas like this, you're like gold, right? I now know something about these customers and they operate in different ways. And these determined four, as I called them, you know, send food, <laughs> send food. They need some help. Um, so, so this was just like a fascinating kind of um, process there of, of going and exploring this. I want to show something else here. Got a couple like this guy who actually is pictured on this page, light boat. You can see that he's growing. That sail is like a wind sail, like a windsurfer sail. It's not large. Um, and you can see that you have um, a like light boat or Angus rowboats that have nearly a straight line. And that's because they're rowing, right? 12.8 knots um, down there in the bottom, bottom right is the, is the fastest that they, is that right? Yeah, hours training over days. Um, that's the fastest that they were going. But you see other boats like Onism and this total distance of 92 miles, uh, nautical miles that is, represents the, the biggest, right? It's the biggest on this uh, middle 11. And what you'll notice is that they're tacking way more than most of the other, um, other racers that, that they're right next to, right? Just fascinating different stories. So as I started pulling this story together, <clears throat> we're talking to friends, right? From uh, sale. I'm looking for more qualitative input. And I watched an obscene amount of Race to Alaska videos on YouTube. I've read the blogs from before the race, through the race, after the race. Um, and they're just, they're amazing adventure stories. And no two stories are the same, much like any kind of these adventure races. Um, and that was fascinating. But as I started pulling the story together, I was still left with a bunch of visualizations that looked something like this with a bunch of metrics um, or the heat map. And so I started bouncing off some of the ideas I had of these insights, like what the story is. And fortunately, like I said, I had two coworkers that did this race. Um, often when you work with a domain expert like this and they light up because you are bringing data that supports the way that they think, right? And the way that they were making decisions. And they gave me such great feedback into helping craft this story and then be able to redirect me where I needed that um, and certainly did, right? Because I just don't have all that knowledge of these different decision points. Um, there's some really hairy points like Seymour uh, Narrows, where you have lots of boat traffic coming through here. Um, and it's, uh, it's, the current is really fast. It's basically a, a kind of a choke point, if you will, of the sea. So talking through that with them really helped affirm where the story was. And then I could go out and finalize the design, the layout, the copy, the font, story, the user experience. And I know I'm sharing the Tableau public version of this. Um, I can point to many uh, you know, um, business use cases here. I would say that they're not as easy to understand right from a business context standpoint as like something like a sailboat race. But the point is, is that the process is the same, right? It's the flow of exploratory analysis, working with experts, thinking about additional data sets, and, and overall thinking and narrowing down what that story is and what the true insights are. I would say I'm fortunate to actually land on some of those insights that ended up being relevant. Um, you know, in that inductive uh, mindset, sometimes you don't get there, right? And I was left with quite a bit of that in the middle of this project. <clears throat> All right, so I'm jumping back to the presentation. I'm gonna go into, uh, um, back to some of the Gartner. Um, and these are the personas or the roles, I should say, that they describe existing uh, from a data ecosystem standpoint. Um, some of these are pretty obvious, like the chief data officer, oh, by the way, step back your skills as an analyst, they add up. And they add up into some of these other roles, or what you'll see is that some of these end up fitting in on the business side, uh, look for my mouse. Like the information product manager, really somebody that's a product manager that owns the outcome of that product in the, you know, to the consumer, but they're driving it from data, right? They're that translator. So all the skills that you're doing every day um, are adding up into potentially some of these paths, progression paths, and, and so I'm, as I'm describing them, what I want you to all be thinking about is where do you uh, align today? And that's going to be a poll question. And then where else are you curious? Because with those poll questions coming back, 
there's people in this community that represent um, maybe all of these different uh, these different roles. So let's just call out a few. David, data driven facilitator we talked about. You know, somebody that can really draw out those requirements, facilitate those big meetings with loud voices and quiet voices that all need to be heard. That's a, a really key role. The analyst, we we know that there's a breadth here, right? This could be the analyst as described by Tableau of like the consumer versus, um, I'm sorry, the interactor versus the creator. Uh, those exist here. The business process analyst we talk about working across ERPs, less attuned to like um, actual performance reporting, things like that, but really uh, squarely in that, where does data go, where does it integrate, et cetera, et cetera. You have a couple roles here, data engineer and data architect uh, that are pretty common uh, and I think well understood. Data ethicist, I wanna spend a, a minute here. With GDPR and CCPA, this is becoming more and more relevant, if not already, uh, for each one of our businesses. Um, it's a big learning phase right now, uh, learning curve, I would say even, of trying to understand exactly what that means. Um, I don't know if, how many of you have watched The Great Hack that's on Netflix, but it's the story of Cambridge Analytica. While we know there, there was quite a few faults there and um, kind of demonized, I would say, in the, in the news, I'm not saying that they didn't have it coming, but if you listen in on that, that movie, that documentary, you hear something and then refer to the persuadables and their ability to understand the social network and who in that social network could be persuaded to vote a different way than they might be today. Like if we were that good at our job, <laughs> that's amazing, right? Finding the nugget of information and that massive amount of data and being able to go act on that in hopefully a positive way, right? So I would turn that back around and say, let's be, and I would challenge this community to be the challengers, right? We need to have the voice of, what is ethical for us to, to pull into our, our data platform and for us to do from an analytic point. We need to be the voice that says, don't land everything in the data lake or the data swamp, but what, what is the least amount of data that I can collect that I can still drive my analytic insights, but I'm not, I'm not risking from a PHI or a PII standpoint um, the outcome here. And so we need to be those challengers. We need to get better at this. We need to challenge each other. Uh, so I wanted to pause on that one and just kind of hit that one a little bit more. I think it's going to be an increasing importance role if it doesn't exist within your company today. <clears throat> Information stewards and uh, master data management. These are roles that work pretty tightly together. The important part is people understand the terms and definitions um, that we are, um, we have policies around how we change those definitions and kind of who gets to make those decisions. Uh, these are important roles, um, often lost, lost in the shuffle somewhere. So um, continue thinking about the importance of that role within your organization. Talked about the product manager. The data sourcing manager is somebody that looks at new integration points, new third-party data sets, um, kind of like the predecessor to the data architect and the data engineer getting involved of thinking about how do we provide that out to the analysts across the um, organization. <clears throat> I talked about the continuous intelligence roles. Uh, this is going to be an interesting one to keep track of that intersection point between uh, digital transformation and business analytics, um, your business uh, applications, as well as your IT groups. So uh, I'd be interested to hear if any of you feel like you align there. And then these final two are more of that data science realm. Um, so business experts here, and the only difference is that the trailblazer is somebody that's thinking kind of that next step from a business standpoint and has the influence to be able to drive those types of decisions across the organization. So with that, let's go to the poll. I'd love to get the feedback from the audience of what role do you best align to today? Is that poll coming up? Uh-oh. <clears throat> Is that Alyssa? There it is, coming up. Sorry guys. No worries. Isabel asked me to be some comedic relief, so should I do the 
do 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 everybody here clearly wants to hear me sing <laughs> nice job not everybody would <laughs> All right, probably results coming up here shortly. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, so a lot of us still, uh, we identify as an analyst, right? And that's that's kind of always been the case, I would say, um, here at the CTUG, right? We, we support you through a lot of these challenges that we're talking about. And I think uh, being able to have these conversations with each other affirm how we're moving our career forward and, and our ability to influence the organization. Um, really cool to see some of the breadth roles here, though, too. Engineers and architects and continuous intelligence. Uh, very cool. Love to hear more of those stories. Okay. Well, I'll be closing out here in the next few minutes. I've um, got a, a couple things to, that I want to cover, though, <clears throat> before we do that. So one is, like, this is Gartner, right, in this, a lot of different roles. Uh, to just from a transparency standpoint, I wanted to share, like, how Solom thinks about our team members. And we think of uh, a broader data and analytics team that's divided in three pillars, the business intelligence and insights team, the advanced analytics team, our data scientists, and the data engineers, which of course includes our architects as well. Um, the important part is that that, that pillar, right? Um, we think of people having majors and minors across the, these pillars and that we all bring this breadth of skills. So when we're thinking about this majority of our team and how we go solve data and analytics um, uh, challenges, right, with our clients, uh, we're thinking about these kind of eight different areas that are most common with our clients. And so I, I thought that that would be just interesting to share. And then the next thing I want to carry into is how we're talking with our clients about modern culture of data. So I talked about this, right? You're either choosing culture um, or, or it's happening to you. And data is the same way. So from a modern culture of data standpoint, we're introducing this framework, which we've, we've had for um, a long time, and it's something that helps both the adoption from a Tableau standpoint, but the impact that you can make across the organization with data. Uh, the truth is, is that we have more data than ever. Right? I talked about data lakes and landing all variety of data um, across the organization that you could tap into, and it's like there's not enough time in the day to go do that. Uh, but really what we're talking about here is the ability to impact and unlock potential across some of the things that you see at the bottom, um, but we're really thinking about disrupting your industry, adjusting quickly to market conditions, which I want to pause on because it's where we're all at here in 2020. We have an unprecedented market condition that, that is impacting our business, but also our society. Uh, I feel really just honored that we're, we have team members that are working with some of our healthcare clients locally, um, specifically with COVID related dashboards and thinking about constraints and planning um, and just like the amount of uh, personal protective equipment on hand at any given point. But I would say that whether you're working with a healthcare uh, a client or you're working with, and we have a team member working with a um, um, movie producer, right? And they have movies out there. And of course, theaters are being impacted as well. And so they're thinking about what are new and innovative ways to, to change our product. And I think that it's that type of bias for action that analytics folks and analysts can drive that is going to change the business um, go forward from this. this Breaking down this framework, I think is useful. It's, um, I wanna start in, right there, there's five key elements. The bold vision, right? It's not dual start with a bold vision when we're thinking about the culture, but you gotta state it, choose intentionally. You wanna chart a clear path. We can talk about sponsorship and um, you know good leadership here, but I think everybody's part of this conversation is part of the analytics organization, is part of that bold vision. Moving over to access and transparency, we think of like the scalable data systems. How do I support both the regulatory compliance, financial, along with experimenting, right? How do I fail fast and try things? Moving over to guardianship, think of some of the conversations we've had around security. Who owns that data, the stewardship of that data, master data management. Um, but like I said, the ethics piece of this is really uh, top of mind for me and I, I hope it is for you as well. Data literacy. It's like speaking to the choir. You all love this topic, right? It's uh, it's how do we help the organization understand their data? Let's see and understand your data. Like Tableau's slogan has been from day one, right? So data literacy, developing that mindset across the organization as well as those citizen roles that we talked about, those hybrid roles. 
And then kind of wrapping all of this is, is that modern culture of data, right? It's that culture that we're driving and we're trying to be intentional with each of those things. So I'm gonna bring up the final poll, um, but really across those five key elements on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see what Uncharted um, looks like, just kind of a summary view of Uncharted versus Embedded. And Embedded meaning not like Embedded Tableau, but Embedded within your organization. It's a thing that you do. Um, and why don't we bring that poll up and I'll kind of keep introducing this a little further. <clears throat> All right, so as it's coming up, I'll describe it a little further. So Psalm, um, we often are focused externally with clients and thinking of having these conversations. Um, I'll provide, again, some transparency that we've looked at our own internal uh, practices, right, of how do we, where are we at today from our modern culture of data? And so we looked at these five areas and, you know, again, being pretty honest is that a lot of our analytics skill sets are going out and working with clients. And we haven't provided that kind of feedback loop in or kind of applied our same knowledge um, to our own business. And so that's meant that I create some of my own reports from an operational practice and team standpoint, where that would be really helpful if it was centralized and available to everybody across the company. So from an operating model standpoint, it may not look like yours, right? Where we're a little bit more hub and spoke across the offices across our country, um, where yours might be somewhat decentralized from like having a, uh, an IT team or BI team that then supports these kind of um, these different business units. And you'll let them operate in a way that allows them to experiment and try things fast. But they also have the support from a central standpoint, from an architecture and best practices, efficiencies, things like that. Um, so, so you know, the point isn't where are you at today and how awesome are you? Um, oh, I don't know if we have a rank one to four, do we? There are radio buttons. Pretend that that was the case. <laughs> um, that's the idea. And so the takeaway here is, is uh, if you were ranking your organization there, and it's fine that we're not conveying it openly here, even though it's kind of anonymous or is anonymous, uh, but take it away, right? What conversations can you drive? So let's switch this question, if you haven't responded to it already, to say, uh, what is the, the number one opportunity for your organization? And I'm sure we'll close that poll out soon. They're still coming in. Awesome. And by the way, um, as they're still coming in, I'll, I'll mention that we had a um, slalom, but so Tableau, Snowflake, and AWS event it's titled Moonshot. And we were, we were going to have that a couple weeks ago before our worlds all changed. And so we're going to move that event out. But the whole idea is that it's focusing on the modern culture of data. And we have the different partners speaking. If you know Ashley Swain, uh, she's been involved with the Tableau community for years and, uh, and is a Alliance partner support at this point. Um, so I work with her on a regular basis. And it's, it's a great conversation, a uh, great presentation, I would say, to allow your different people within your organization, whether they're uh, decision makers or analysts. So I'd encourage you to look out for that event. I'm sure we'll announce it at a future um, Tableau user group. For those of you kind of all over the country, we are offering those uh, events in the different markets that um, Psalm and, and Tableau are going to. So we can provide more information on that. Cool. All right, so I, I'm kind of assuming that we went with the second version of that question, which is where does your team need most the most support and data literacy shows up there. Um, yep, that's that's an area right that we continue to focus from this Tableau uh, community and, and, uh, and continue to be it's important in our role that we take that out to our different stakeholders. We did some first party research reaching out to our clients and polling them of where they feel like they're at. Um, in this in this journey and so as part of that moonshot event we provide a, a an insight like kind of readout of where they're at and I will just say I don't have those stats in front of me right now but um, you're not alone <laughs> you're not alone our organizations are all making this journey to see if they can move from uncharted to embedded and many of us are somewhere there in the, the early stages or in the middle and and there's no fault in that um, I would say the only fault is not taking that next right step <clears throat> okay on next steps, I didn't mean for that to segue quite as well as it did. Um, <laughs> next steps for you. 
So I want to just put the, 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 these next steps out there, um, let you know that, that I'm willing to be part of that conversation, but your community here is as well. You've got great community leaders. Um, they can kind of help funnel those conversations to other team, other community members. But I want you to think about where you're at today. Use the mind map. I'm sure we're providing this content. Use that mind map, circle the roles that you do today, and maybe put a plus sign or something like that that says, this is what I'd like to add from a skill standpoint as I go forward. Have that conversation with your community members, your people manager, um, whoever it might be, and explore these roles further. I challenge you to consider how you shape your existing team, right? your existing kind of culture of data. How do you um, bring up these conversations that not in a contrarian way, right? Because we're trying to influence and we don't influence through just saying there's a right way and a wrong way, right? It's not a Gartner report is the Bible. It's Gartner report provides this guidance and hopefully this presentation provides some guidance about how we talk about our role, how we grow and how we change towards a modern culture of data. That's the fourth point. How does your team measure up against that modern culture of data and that framework? I would just challenge you to openly have that conversation with team members and think about what are those next steps that you can do. And the final is just engage with your community. Keep this conversation going. Um, last point is the two Gartner papers that I've referenced as part of this presentation supporting some of these points. They're listed down there at the bottom. Uh, so I want to make sure that you had my sources um, and what was there. Thank you again for letting me be part of this community again. It's been a, just an absolute pleasure. I love what this is about, what they do. Thanks to each of those CTUG leaders, and I'll see you soon, I'm sure. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks for joining yeah. us today. And I know we've got a lot of um, people in the comments and in the Q&A section asking for the mind map and the presentation. And reminder, this is being recorded. We'll send out everything um, sometime later after this is all done. So if anybody has questions for Anthony, I don't know if you can stick around for a little bit, maybe on the Q&A yeah, section. Um, so now would be a great time to throw questions for Anthony into the QA if you haven't. Otherwise, it's just me attempting to answer things from Anthony's presentation. <laughs> so, you know. Anyway, I actually, thank you. I have, a, I have a question for Anthony, if I'm, if I'm allowed to kick us off. Yeah. So Thanks, uh, Gina. When, we're, when we're talking about data discovery and kind of that, more of that exploratory analytics where we just take the time to sit down with the data set and open it up and, and kind of let the questions lead to the next questions, right? Not necessarily know exactly what we're trying to answer, just kind of go with it. How do we as a standard analyst, maybe not in a management role, fight for the time to do that? Like how do we work with our managers to say, hey, I want to just sit with this data set for four hours and kind of cl click around and <laughs> find the story because I think that that's, Definitely a challenge, especially when you have to bill your hours to yeah. kind of fight for that. Yep. No, it's awesome, right? And that's exactly the point of we work with constraints that don't exist on the Tableau public side, right? The fact that I'm sitting in there kind of nights and weekends having a blast working with Tableau and like building that story out, it, that, that time uh, constraint isn't there in the same way, right? Um, what I would say is that it's important that we continue talking about, and Gartner really does hit this, right? The deductive and inductive mindset are important for your organization to be able to find new insights, not just answer the diagnostic ones or the things that we've always heard. So number one is I think we've got to convey the value of taking the time, right? Time boxing that with them, saying here's the expectations, and it may not be some findings, but agree to a time box effort there. Um, I would say that sometimes these, these are the types of things that um, you try to find a little bit of, you know, sliver of time that you can get into a little bit of that flow and do the exploratory analysis in between other things. Um, from, a, from a consulting standpoint, um, I think these are the things that we're usually doing because we're challenged by the business problem that is in front of us, and they don't rarely go towards billable hours, right? But we don't think of those things as just negative, right? We're trying to bring more value to, to the team. And I would say that whether you're a consultant or not, that's what we do as analysts every day, right? We're bringing more value to something that is, uh, is challenging. Uh, Jane, I remember us talking about this, um, I don't know, maybe a year ago? Where I was talking exploratory analysis, discovery, <laughs> and you were saying, isn't that just analysis? And I mean, totally, right? Whatever we call it. Uh, the point is, is, it's an important part of this process, especially where there's more hypotheses rather than, than like clear outcomes of what this work will look like. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Well, thanks, Anthony, for sticking around. And I know we've got at least one question out there for you. Um, yeah. And everybody on the chat, thanks for 
for chiming in. And uh, I know we've got a couple good su suggestions for people who are new to Tableau. So just a quick plug for um, community.tableau.com for people. And um, if you're new or have questions or get stuck, that's a great place to go. Um, and then someone mentioned that a lot of local libraries have subscriptions to LinkedIn Learnings. So that's another great place for learning stuff. Um, awesome, thank you, Anthony. So um, thanks everybody for sticking with us. I know that a lot of people are very excited about 2020 and we are excited today to have Zach from Tableau who's gonna talk about some of the cool new features. Are you ready, Zach? I am so ready. I'm about to awesome. Share. We'll hand it over to you then. Awesome. Thank you. All right, that was uh, super exciting. Thanks, Anthony, for sharing all that. And uh, thanks to Saul. Um, so quick intro. Uh, my name is Zach. Um, I work with Tableau. I'm a lead solution engineer. Uh, so that means I help uh, our, our clients with all the technical stuff. And whether it's Tableau desktop or uh, server architecture on Tableau server, um, and uh, I used to be a data engineer, um, data architect, uh, so that's my background, but I fell in love with Tableau when I worked at Capital One, um, so I joined up with Tableau. And I was on the mail team, so sorry for all the spam mail, that was my fault. Um, so <laughs> we're gonna hop into it, um, and uh, we've got a lot to cover in only 30 minutes, so we're, we're gonna be hopping around a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna be going over a few different examples, uh, just so you can see some things in actual action. Uh, because I got the sense that most of you guys are analysts, uh, we're gonna be covering mostly the visual analytics stuff, uh, but we'll briefly touch on uh, the other things that came out with 2020.1, uh, because it was a huge release. All right, so let's hop into it. Okay, <laughs> the very first thing on, on this, uh, on this update that I wanted to list on this slide was dynamic parameters. <laughs> huge, 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 huge thing. Um, so they don't sound so cool. Uh, it has been our, uh, our highest voted um, feature request on our idea form, uh, dynamic parameters at 2,900 votes. Uh, so what exactly are dynamic parameters? Um, well, uh, dynamic parameters are a way to update your parameters based on updates in the data. Uh, so here I am in a Tableau workbook, and we have two parameters here, a start date and an end date, uh, and these are just parameters. Uh, these are selectable. Uh, normally, before 2020.1, uh, if we update our data in a workbook that's published on Tableau server, um, then this value isn't gonna change. This is, this is a static value. So the first time I select it, it is not going to change uh, when new data is uploaded and new people log in to view the workbook. Um, however, uh, now what we can do is we could change this based on the data itself. Uh, so what I'm gonna do, to show you how we do this, is I'm gonna edit this parameter. Okay, so just so we can keep track of everything, there's a lot going on in this workbook. We have two parameters, a date range start and a date range end. Um, so we can select the value when the workbook opens and we can set it to the current value, which is what it used to be. So that, that's what it is currently set at. Uh, but now what we can do is we can use calculated fields. So I wanna use a calculated field today. Now I could take a look at that calculator field and it just says today. All right, so what's that gonna do? Uh, well, when we, when we open up the workbook every single time we do, uh, regardless of the day, uh, I mean, regardless of the data that's in the, uh, the actual workbook, I mean, the data set, we're always gonna open up uh, this workbook with a parameter set to today. Uh, now, we, we could base it on the, the actual data itself as well. So let's say I want to go to a list instead of all values. Um, so what we're used to seeing is adding values from a list. Uh, so it looks like this is date coming from ship date. And we can add all these values, or actually I think it's coming from somewhere else. Order date. Okay, so this list would normally be something that's static uh, and something that doesn't change. We can only add all these values in from the data once. Uh, but now what we could do instead 
is we can do this based on uh, what is actually in the data set itself. So when the workbook opens, we'll be loading in all the range of values. Uh, so this is another uh, another thing that we can we can do with dynamic parameters, and this is really really big. Um, so what else can we do with dynamic parameters? Uh, so in this workbook, we can uh, select any of these categories to drill down. So right now we're drilling down on clothing uh, into two subcategories: shoes and shirts, and it's highlighting shoes and shirts in this other chart over here. Uh, now I get, this is a parameter that I can enter in, so I, I could decide to enter in something else, uh, like furniture. And now furniture is gonna be highlighted, uh, all the bubbles here, and it's gonna expand in this. Uh, so we could already do that. Uh, what we couldn't do is make this a list of dynamically updating values. Uh, if we had a list before, and we added values from that list, these would be the only values that would show up in the workbook from here on out. So if I press OK, for example, oops, let me go back here. OK, so these are the values that would show going for, I, I, I mean, just at this current snapshot. Uh, however, uh, if let's say a new category was added in the data, uh, like uh, um, chairs, for example, those would not appear in the workbook going forward. So now what we can do is let's say we want to you know, future proof this in case the data changes, we can select the data from the category and load it every single time the workbook opens. And then we're always going to have that value. And here they are. Cool. Um, man, I'm so used to asking questions, but unfortunately there's so many of you and I, and I can't, but I will be able to uh, answer questions at the end, uh, assuming that we have time. Uh, so let's hop back into other features that we're adding. So Viz animations, <laughs> this is a really, really cool one. Um, so as it sounds, uh, Viz animations mean we're going to start we've now enabled functionality for visualizations to be animated when something has changed in the workbook. Uh, so this is a really cool feature. Uh, however, uh, the human eye is very, very, very uh, accustomed to tracking movement. Uh, you know, when we were uh, way back in the days when we we're still living in ca caves and hunter gatherers, uh, we would use our eyes to track movement to see if we could get food or to see if we were in danger. And so we're really used to looking for movement. And if it is going to be in a dashboard, uh, it is gonna be the first thing that people see. So we have to take caution when using it and use it with purpose to make sure that it, it, it's serving, uh, answering an actual question because it could be distracting otherwise, uh, but it's really cool. Uh, so let's take a look at some examples and then I'll show how to build them. All right, uh, so here we have just a plain old bar chart, um, and we have a few different categories up at the top, uh, and we can go ahead and click on any of these to filter it down. So this is gonna be a combination of using set actions as well. Uh, I'm gonna head and press consumer. So what happened was now this is showing what percent, or the, what is the total amount of phones that come from this consumer segment, and then what total number of phones uh, are outside of that consumer segment. Now, if we switch to corporate, for example, everything is gonna stay the same because the, uh, the total values are gonna stay the same because the access is being held in place. Now, this is really helpful to see a comparison between these different segments without showing multiple charts at the same time. Uh, so this saves real estate, it answers questions really quickly, um, and it's, just a pleasant experience to look at. Um, and a, a huge, huge functionality here. Let's take a look at another one. So most of these I, I took off uh, Tableau Public, um, just different examples that different users around the world uh, have created, and I thought they were really cool. Um, so this is an old one, I think it was made in 2013, 2014 or so, um, and this shows 
hurricane locations and, and track patterns. Um, so it uses the pages feature, uh, but now with Viz animation, it's a lot smoother. Uh, so it looks like an actual animation. And we can track each hurricane um, and, and their individual paths. Uh, now, uh, hopefully it's coming through over the Zoom meeting. Uh, it might not look as fluid, uh, but we wanted to show you an idea of the art of the possible here. Um, another one, so I, I have seen a lot of trending recently on like bar chart race recently, um, and I was so uh, upset that Tableau couldn't do it uh, exactly uh, in the way that uh, bar charts so fluidly move in these bar chart races, uh, but now it can. Uh, and uh, so this is a data set on the top songs uh, starting in 1983 on the um, USA chart list. Um, and now we can go ahead and do a bar chart race. So you should see that each of these bars is animating now. Uh, we're seeing what they used to be and what they're moving to. Uh, instead of just a complete refresh of the visualization every single time. Uh, so uh, this is something I've been really waiting on for a long time uh, because bar chart races are, are just are able to tell a story so easily. And it looks like Michael Jackson and Billie Jean took first place for a while uh, until he got beat by Michael Jackson uh, with Beat It. Oh, no, I guess it didn't get there. <laughs> uh, but Irene carried it. Um, I'll show one more example. Uh, so this is using parameter actions as a scroll bar uh, to uh, check out the ranking of these uh, different market segments. So we have Central, East, West, and South, and uh, how they rank against each other, let's say in terms of sales, month to month. Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and just hover over this down at the bottom. And what's happening is it's acting like a scroll bar. Um, and as we keep scrolling, the data updates, the viz keeps animating so that we can keep track of things going forward. So really cool feature. Um, now let's hop in on how we would actually build this app. Uh, one second, sorry, I got a lot of tabs open. All right, uh, let's go ahead and try building one. Um, so I'm gonna grab sales and just bring it onto my rows shelf. And I'm also gonna bring in my order date. And maybe I'm gonna show this quarterly. Okay, so I've got a line chart, um, and let's say I want to take a look at different uh, categories for my sales over time. So I'm going to go ahead and show my filter. Okay, so it's already set to animate, but we are actually going to have to turn it on when we open up a new workbook. Uh, so it's going to be under the format tab and it's going to be animations. So by default, it's going to be off. And I think the reason behind this is because animations are extremely captivating, captivating for the human eye. And we want to make sure that when we use it, we use it deliberately. Uh, so we can just go up into format, click on an animation, and then we can turn them on. Now we can set defaults for the workbook as a whole, and we can also do this by sheet. So let's say we don't want it on for our given sheet. Um, so this is what we're used to when it's off. And although we can get an idea of what's happening, it's really hard to keep track of which month or which quarters are, are changing in which direction. Uh, too much is happening too quickly. Uh, so what we can do, is we can set the duration. Uh, I'm gonna make this kind of slower so we can really see this line chart change. Um, and we have two different styles. We can do simultaneous or sequential. I'll keep it simultaneous. Um, and let's take a look at what happens to tech from going from technology over to furniture. 
Okay, so we got an idea of how the, the pattern is changing here, but I also saw that this axis change. Uh, and to get like an absolute idea of how the values change, we want to keep this consistent. So I'm going to set this at about 200,000. And we're going to go and change it from furniture to office supplies now. Okay, so I saw a lot of different things happen. I saw in 2017 Q4, this went down, while uh, 2019 Q1, that went up uh, between the different categories. And uh, it, it just makes it a lot easier to recognize changes. Now, this animations aren't going to take over everything. And, and like I said before, we should definitely take caution to use them sparingly. Uh, you know, something that might be better in this scenario uh, instead of using animations is probably just to bring category out uh, onto the row shelf. And then we can see them all and compare them uh, side by side. Uh, but there, there are times when the, that might be taking up too much real estate. We really want to highlight one aspect. All right. Let's head back to the PowerPoint. How much time do we have? Okay. Plenty of time. So um, this animation is super exciting. Uh, I, another one that I have been waiting for for a long time uh, is buffer calculations. And I, I didn't know how to voice it before because I didn't really know what I was looking for. Uh, but I have a few clients. I, I work with a, a major retailer in the US that um, has been trying to calculate um, or trying to assign certain, uh, anyone within like a 50 mile radius of their stores to that particular store so that they can uh, understand the demographics for the radius around the store. Uh, and that used to be extremely challenging. We had to go through a lot of different calculations. Uh, and even after that, we really couldn't get a, a good visualization of that. Um, so now uh, we have something called buffer calculations. Uh, and buffer calculations are a spatial function that can create a, a circle radius or, or a circle given a radius around a given latitude and longitude um, or, or a given point, so to speak. Uh, so here we have a calculation that just says buffer and we're taking a geometry point and we are highlighting an area within one mile of now, I don't want to go into a whole data structure um, and you know calculation exercise because this can get a little long uh, and we don't have too much time, but I, I do want to show an example of how this works. So this is just on someone's Tableau public profile um, and they use the buffer calculation to create a map. Um, and so in this visualization, uh, we're taking a look at Sydney, Australia, it looks like and a bunch of different locations uh, of different schools. Um, and we wanna take a look at anything within a radius of maybe 0.4 miles within each school. And all of a sudden, this is a really simple thing to do. Uh, now, I, I, this is a really, really powerful uh, thing when taken beyond the world of visualization and into the world of data blending as well. Uh, so this is our help page. Um, I mean, I, this is a blog article on the buffer function. And I want to walk you guys through an example of when this might be really, really handy. Um, so assume we have uh, I, some longitude latitude points. And uh, we decide we want to highlight areas around them. So we can now use the buffer function. And, and that is a huge benefit by itself. Uh, beyond that, though, Let's say uh, we want this to be variable. So we, we add a parameter so that we can change the buffer size you know, to be anywhere within 100 miles. Now, uh, we want to be able to capture any data point from another data set that falls within that radius, whatever it is, whether it's a 10 mile radius, 100 mile radius for each of those points. All right. So, we want to bring in another data set and blend that together with this buffer function. Uh, so now what we can do is in our uh, data tab, we can create an intersection, a spatial join, 
from one spatial file to this new this spatial file with a buffer calculation. Um, so in this specific one, we're using a static uh, number of feet, a thousand feet, rather than using a, a parameter that can change. Uh, but we can add a parameter here so that the user can change this. So what this is doing is it's saying, hey, whenever a data point from my one spatial file is within a hundred feet of a data point from this other spatial file, I want to capture that and leave everything else behind. So what we end up doing in this example is everything is highlighted when it is within one of the buffer calculations. Uh, and we can expand that buffer based on a parameter and then more points will be added to it. Uh, so this is super, super powerful. Uh, and we can really start doing some like heavy geoanalysis um, analytics here. All right. So I'll talk on one more. I think that's all for the, the examples, but there are still a ton of features that I'd like to get through. Um, so now we can customize the Discover pane for Tableau Desktop. Uh, that should make your workflow a lot easier. Um, and of course, with almost every update, we're making updates to the new feature explain data. It should work better with wide data sets now and be more performant. Um, it has been a problem in the past for that, so it should be able to perform better now. Um, also, we just released uh, TabPy 1.0. Uh, so for everyone that is working with advanced analytics, um, this is huge because now it's all officially supported. We have secure connections uh, and it's no longer a, you know, a, a, a beta product, so to speak. Uh, completely officially supported now. Um, for our Tableau public users, uh, we have some dashboards, uh, dashboard extensions that you can now use. Um, we, we uploaded them to our, our own internal server um, and now we can use them on Tableau public. Uh, in the web, so I, I would actually like to call this out. Uh, there's a workbook. Uh, if you just Google um, Tableau Desktop versus uh, web authoring, uh, we have a someone that is keeping track of a, a workbook out on Tableau Public uh, that can compare all the features in Tableau Desktop to Tableau web editing. Um, so this is really helpful uh, because it, it keeps track of all the different versions. Um, for you know 2020.1, uh, this just shows all the things that WebEdit does not have uh, in 2020.1 that Tableau Desktop has, um, and you know the ones that both of them have. We're really trying to close the gap here on on the features, and we're trying to get to parity. Uh, it is taking some time, but uh, in 2020.1, we've added some pretty cool new features. Uh, so an export dashboard button. Um, so this is just creating a button within uh, the visualization that a user can press to immediately download an image of PDF or PowerPoint. Um, also a play button in the, in the browser. Uh, this was important to add, especially for now, because it's got, the pages is going to be used with uh, uh, Viz animations now. Viz and Tooltip, uh, my personal favorite. <laughs> uh, the, we, we came out in 2019.4 with uh, being able to edit the Tooltip, uh, but now we can uh, do a lot more with the, the Viz and Tooltip within the browser. And a lot of mapping improvements, uh, using map layers, repeat backgrounds, et cetera. All right, so I'm gonna briefly go over the data side because I wanna leave time for questions. Uh, we have a lot of new connectors for Tableau Catalog. Uh, for those of you that have the data man management add-on, um, a lot of cloud file connections in uh, Google. Uh, so those, those data sources will be able to be seen by Tableau now. Uh, a new Impala connector and a uh, brand new Salesforce connector that is really exciting uh, because this is way more performant than a last connector. Uh, we um, we recognize that we weren't really at par to where we wanted to be with our Salesforce connector and considering now we're the uh, same company, um, we, we decided to put a lot of effort into fixing that. Um, so now our Salesforce connector is really performant um, and it has access to a lot more data objects. 
Um, so for those who use, who use Tableau Prep and are more on the advanced side, you can now use level of detail calculations. Uh, this is really exciting because you won't have to create a bunch of extra steps to sum up your data and then rejoin it back together on itself. You can now just go ahead and use an LOD expression. Um, some additional features like connector highlighting. So if you press any given step in Tableau Prep, you'll be able to see all the connections it came from. Uh, and this is just important for users because we really want to make sure that this is an intuitive, uh, like visual process. And, and that's what Tableau Prep is trying to do, to make data engineering a, a visual process and easy for a casual user. Um, I think I'm going to pause here. There's still a solid amount, and I can send this out after. Um, but I do want to save some time for questions. So how do I take a look at questions? Just seeing the Q and A. If if you click the Q and A button there, yeah. the window should pop open for you. Um, I think we had one person who was asking for an example of um, toggling set actions, which I know is something that came out in a more recent version of Tableau. Could you read out the question? I'm having a hard time getting the Q and A to pop up. Sure. Um, I think we, we've had a lot of people asking for copies of the workbooks. So um, you said that's something that you're able to share with people. I think that'll be really great. Yeah, um, I can probably do that. And I've lost track of the other question. If anybody has questions and wants to post them now, um, I know we're, we're almost at time. But um, Dak, if there's, is there a good place for people who have questions about the newest features of 2020.1, uh, a good place that you'd recommend that they go? Yeah, oh yeah, that, that's, that is a great call out. So uh, the first place I would definitely check out is, on the Tableau, uh, new releases page. So this is a good place to start. So it's actually the Tableau New Features page, for my mistake. Um, it's a good place to start to get a high level overview of every single thing that we've added in 2020.1. And there's quite a lot of stuff. Um, if you have more questions about a particular thing, uh, like dynamic parameters, I would first recommend checking out our help document or our blog series. Uh, so that should just be a quick Google lay away. So Tableau dynamic parameters help. So this is going to be our blog page, uh, which is going to give you some examples. Uh, and it can walk you through how to use dynamic parameters, for example. Um, our help page is also going to be a great resource. Um, or we also have learn learning tutorials. Um, so I, I, I would first direct it towards Google, and that's going to take you to the best or the most viewed part of, of the Tableau website. Um, but between our help page, our, our tutorial videos, and our blogs, um, there is going to be a lot of resources. Great. Yeah. I think one person was asking, um, wanted to see again the example of how to get the date range to end with today. And that was a dynamic parameter. So I don't know if that's called out on that blog post um, or if you can just... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hop quickly back go. to that real quick. Yeah. Yeah, I'll quickly go over that uh, just because. Do, 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 do. Uh, some more of these guys. All right, so um, let's check out this sheet. Okay, so we have our parameters date range n and date range start. Uh, so these are just the parameters where we're giving them a date. So the first thing you're going to want to do is like, a create a calculated field if you want it to be today and not based on the data itself. Uh, so the calculated field, I'm just using the function today. And then when I go into the date range end function to edit the parameter, um, we can now select a specific value that we want it to, to be based on more than just what it currently is. So now we can select it based on uh, date uh, date uh, fields in our, our calculated field list. Uh, so there's one that's three months ago today and one that's today. Uh, so that is a way to do that. 
Great. All right. Hopefully that helped answer your question, Laura. And then we have an anonymous question that was asking about toggling set actions, which I think maybe was included in the one bar chart. Yeah. So You're saying using a combination of set actions and parameter actions. Yeah, so th this one is using set actions. So uh, it's a combination of viz animations and set actions. Uh, so the only thing viz animation is doing is just making it a, a very fluid process to you know create these these bar charts from uh, as we click each one. Uh, but set actions is a completely different thing. I, if the question is you know how, how do we actually create a set action? Um, these are a little bit more complicated, uh, and I would be uh, it would probably take me a little bit of time to go through it. But essentially, what we're doing is we we create a set. Um, and that set is, you know, what in or out, um, and how we change that set is in our dashboard actions. Um, and when we go to dashboard actions, we normally see a bunch of like, uh, you know, filter actions, highlight actions, uh, but set actions is something different. Uh, so the set was already created. Uh, but now what this, this set action is doing is we're saying, hey, uh, anytime I select a segment, I want to add that value to my set. Now, I, I, I could decide to remove that from my set or I could keep set values, but I, I just want to add that value to my segment set. Uh, so every time I press, uh, that's going to add to that set. So the current set of in is just corporate. Uh, now when I change it to consumer, that set of in is uh, just going to be consumer. Cool. Great. Well, we are um, a bit out of time. We do appreciate everybody um, sticking with us for the whole presentation today. Hopefully people enjoyed it. Thank you, Zach, for um, showing us all these things. I know there's a lot in here and I uh, had to cover it very quickly. So appreciate you doing that. Um, we are going to, you know, obviously people are going to need to hop off. Um, we want to just remind everybody that this will be available. Uh, we'll send out the content and we will be sending out a follow-up survey. And we really appreciate it if you would give us some feedback on what you'd like to see in your Tableau user groups. So thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Zach. Um, also to Gina and Vignesh, uh, who are co-hosting, and Alyssa, who's providing us with some operational support in those polls and things today. So if anybody wants to stick around for another minute, maybe um, Zach can help answer some last questions, but just wanted to wrap for those that need to get going to other things today, so. Um, we did have a question, Zach, from Eric, who was asking about if there were any future release feature improvements to set actions. Um, that is a good question. I, I would imagine so since there's a whole team, uh, devoted to that specific feature. Uh, but I, I don't know anything about what is on that roadmap for now. There we go. Okay. Any other last minute questions? Um, someone did say they would like to see zoom added to our regular in-person meetings. Um, it's something we've discussed. We really do want to encourage people to come in person. Um, we think that's a really important part of the Tableau community, but it is something that we have discussed before um, and definitely appreciate your thoughts and feedback. We know that not everybody can make it in person, so we definitely want to share out content that's at meetings and things, so, yeah. Great. Okay. Doesn't look like we have any more questions today. So again, everybody, thank you for coming and hanging out with us and hopefully uh, gave you plenty of things to think about um, <laughs> as, as we're all working from home. And I uh, encourage you to get online, join the communities, find us on social media. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks so much everyone.